this is where I started. I started as the, the Kingdom Steel, King Sancho, right? And if we look through my different rulers through here, so let's change this camera over to here. And this is gonna be better for now. Um, and if we look through my different rulers, right, you can see how I expanded. This is my second ruler. I had been able to take over most of Iberia, and then my next ruler, I took over the rest of Iberia, declared the Empire of Spain. Uh, my next ruler, um, I kind of stagnated on the conquering, but I achieved a lot, and we'll take a look at, at what exactly uh, this guy did besides conquering later. Um, then I started eating up France, and and finished here, um, dominating Western Europe and moving into the rest of the Mediterranean. And you see that I had Rome and Byzantium here, and I was trying to um, mend the schism, but I kind of got bored and uh, stopped with that. Um, so if we take a look more specifically here, we can go back to the Kingdom of Castile, and uh, we can take a look, um, actually, yeah, it's here. We can take a look at the first tip, the first tip that I wanna give you guys here. No, nope, not that. And it's about renown, all right? And uh, we can move this back here. We're gonna look at this monitor. Um, and we're here at the beginning of the game, and here we have King Sancho, and um, it's really easy to look at Renown with King Sancho because he is earning a ton of it um, for so early in the game. You see, it's 1066. It's the very beginning of the game. I haven't done a single thing, and yet King Sancho is up here earning um, almost six Renown a month. And if you guys don't know why that is, if you don't know how to earn Renown, you could take a look at here, you can click on this little number, and you can see that the fastest way to earn Renown, oh, come back, is here. There are five independent kings of my dynasty, all right? And um, if you take a look, we can actually find all five of them, is Galicia, Leon, Castile, Navarra, and Aragon. These are five independent kings. They're no one's vassals, they're just independent. And each one of them earns one renown. And, um, you know, uh, independent barons earn renown, independent dukes earn renown, living members earn renown. And renown is really cool for a few reasons. Uh, one, the most obvious, and the one that most of you probably already know, is you can uh, buy these legacies, right? And they just updated all of these with the, the new patch, the new DLC, updated a bunch of these, and I think made them better. Um, some of them are still a little bit boring, um, but they are better than they used to be. And what you want to think about when you are choosing the upgrades that you get, your dynasty legacies, is what kind of game you're going to be playing. And so if you're going to be going for a lot of crusading, a lot of fighting, um, then you want to go with warfare, right? If you're going to be doing a lot of eugenics, a lot of like thinking very carefully who your heirs are going to be marrying, trying to get a lot of traits into your bloodline, then go with blood. Um, and all of these have very different and specific traits. And some of them go very well together. So like I said, that blood is very good if you're trying to do eugenics. Well, blood goes very good with kin because you see here you have an addition to fertility. Well, if you're trying to breed a lot of people, uh, a lot of good people, then you want fertility, right? And so these two end up going very well together along with studious youth that you get better education traits, all right? So um, your your renown is very useful for this. But another thing that a lot of people don't know about renown is the splendor levels. 
And this is something that I, I actually learned during this run. During this run with the Germanas, I learned about Splendor. And you see here, you have all of these different levels of Splendor. And if you go down here and look, you can see all the different bonuses that they give. And if you get down here into these bigger ones, they're, they're kind of OP. Um, because like here, you see that we are reputable. Okay, and reputable is, is fine, it's nice. But look at this. The, you, you get 25 long reign opinion. So that's nice when you have a, a long reign ruler. Um, that's helpful, that's nice. But check out, oh, go back. Check out if you can get down here to like glorious, plus 45, fabled, plus 50, plus 55. This almost guarantees that you do not have civil wars and factions. If you can get up to legendary or or fabled, then you can you can be uh, like murdering your vassals, being being terrible to your vassals, and they will still not rebel because you are legendary or or fabled and have that extra long reign opinion. Now the other nice thing about it is that your children are born. Look at this. Your children are born with prestige. And the more renown that you have, the more prestige that they're born with. And, and that will help you um, when you have young heirs that take the throne, which is always a problem when you have like a baby that ends up taking the throne and they have very, very little prestige, then you run into problems. But if you have this, this high level of splendor, you kind of mitigate that problem, right? And, and so, um, what you gotta what you gotta remember is how to earn renown. And something that I did this game was for a long time after I I conquered Leon and Galicia, I murdered my brothers. I left Navarra and Aragon independent, even though I could conquer them. I could have. It would not have been a problem for me to conquer them. And that let me build up a lot of renown. Okay, so that's renown. That's that's what I learned about renown on this run. And if we uh, move on to the next, that is slowed up here. King Luis, eleven twenty-eight. It's this guy. And what did we learn in King Luis? We learned about succession. Okay. And um, the thing about succession is for a large chunk of the game, right? Because if we go in here into our fascinations, right, you do not get access to primogeniture until the late medieval era, which is usually somewhere in the 1200s. And so in a, in a game where you start in 1066, you might be able to get it in 150 years. But if you start in the 867 uh, start point, it's going to be a long time before you have any access to primogeniture, right? So you're going to be dealing with these partition laws for a huge part of the game. And a lot of people find them annoying. A lot of people um, just wish, oh, why can't we switch to primogenitor? They get mods that switch them out of primogenitor. But honestly, it is it is not a problem. Um, and oh, my, my picture is actually kind of in the way of showing you why. Um, so if we pause. If I just get rid of my camera for a moment, or do the overlay here. You can see that um, I have partition, but I only have one heir inheriting everything, and yet, I have one, 
I have multiple sons. Right. So how did I pull that off? Well, the answer is that you want to give the reason to avoid partition problems, the way to avoid partition problems. The way to avoid partition problems is it says in the rules right here about partition. Okay. It says, um, that upon succession, all titles held by the late ruler will be divided amongst heir eligible children. With the player heir always begin with the primary title, rem capital, only direct digital titles, blah, 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 blah. Younger children will be given titles starting with those of the same rank as the primary title. If none are available, they will be given lower ranking titles. Okay, so the first thing that you want to do is you want to get out of Confederate partition because the big difference between Confederate partition and partition is that if we look here, younger children will have titles created for them. Okay, so if you have like extra land somewhere, anywhere in your realm that could create a duchy or a kingdom, the game will create the duchy or the kingdom for younger children. Um, so Confederate partition, yeah, I agree. Confederate partition is bullshit and you need to get out of that. But regular partition is actually not that bad. Um, and And so... What you got to do to avoid problems with regular partition is you need to give your children duchies. If all of your eligible heirs own their own duchy, then, then your domain will not get split up. And that's what you need to do. Okay? So... As long as your extra sons, this is my son, my player heir, right? My other sons, my other extra possible heirs, all own their own duchy. And so they are not inheriting any of my domain. And that is how you solve the uh, partition issue. Now, um, the, the next thing to talk about here is what to do with your heirs and what to do with education. Um, which, which leads us into a, a discussion about lifestyle focuses. Now, this king, this is my second king, King Luis. He's the son of King Sancho. And I'm not gonna go back to King Sancho right now, but King Sancho was martial. King Sancho had all of this strategist. He might have also had gallant, I don't remember. And that was great for King Sancho because he conquered almost all of the Iberian Peninsula during his reign. He was a conqueror. All right. Now, um, he wasn't very much uh, on stewardship or diplomacy, but he conquered. He basically did the entire Reconquista by himself. And so that was important for him. But now, now his son is focused on stewardship because we want this architect trait to build buildings. And you see with the architect trait, you get building construction time, professional workforce building construction time, cutting corners so it's cost. All right, so if you wanna build stuff, this architect trait is huge. So you really gotta think just like the, the legacies here, what do you want to do at the moment? So at the beginning of my run, I knew I was going to be conquering. So I took these two, just like King Sancho took the, the lifestyle choice of strategist, my first king. All right, but my second king is now more focused on, on development, on stewardship because I need to stop conquering and build up my realm. And so that's what he's doing, all right? Later in the game, when, when you have your, your domain more built up, when money is less 
of, of a need, maybe you want to switch into learning to, to work on technology. And then scientific, this learn on the job thing is super OP, super powerful, okay? So just like anything else in this game, it really depends on what you're trying to do at the moment, okay? And the same is true for what you're going to be teaching your heir, right? So this guy, Infante de Ego Luisa, okay? He's intelligent, he's curious, and I am training him in education. Because Spain is very behind on, on technology, okay? We are in the high medieval. But we're still we're still trying to catch up on these fascinations here. And so I want my next son to be working on learning to get that boost for the technology research. Furthermore, something that I that I learned during this run is as soon as your son becomes an adult, you want to put him into your council. And why? Well, because the people in your council actually get a boost to their lifestyle focus while they're in their while they're in the council. So like this guy, you see he's got 20 stewardship. That's wonderful. If we go look at him, he is on the wealth focus. He is building up. Okay, all of your characters, they have lifestyle focuses, okay? People in your in your council have a lifestyle focus. So if you put your son, you put your heir into your council, he will, um, just like any other character, be developing his lifestyle. But what's cool about your council is that depending on your level, if you're a duke, if you're a king, if you're an emperor, your council members develop their lifestyle focus faster. They get a boost, a 10, 15, 20%, I believe, boost to lifestyle. If you're a council member of an emperor, you get a 20% boost to lifestyle focus. So you want your heir to be in your council so that they can just run through whatever lifestyle uh, uh, tree that they are working on. And then when they grow up, when you die and your heir takes over, they will have tons and tons and tons of lifestyle focuses. Okay? so. That, that's it for succession. That's it for heirs. Um, remember to always keep an eye on succession when you have multiple children. You want to keep your domain together. You want to keep your domain safe and not split up. That's the simplest way to, to maintain stability and to maintain power. Okay? Um, just another quick couple tips before before we go about lifestyle focuses at different points in your life you're going to want different lifestyles too like if you have an old king you want him to live a little bit longer you can take these three lifestyle focuses um, anatomical studies wash your hands earn constitution they come really quickly they're easy and you can live a little bit longer if you have a a, a bunch of children in your 20s you're a king, you have a bunch of children in your 20s, and you don't want to have more children, you can take restraint, which will let you do celibacy. Okay? And then you won't have any more children, which goes back to the succession issue, right? Um, another thing you can do when you're old is you can take groom to rule, which will just automatically grant one to three extra skill points to all of your children. So it's something you can do like you, you think... You're maybe 60, 65, 70 years old. You know you're going to die soon. Switch into diplomacy and take groom to rule right before you die. And just automatically give your heir two or three bonus points. Okay? Uh, and, of course, you know, if you're trying to murder someone, you can switch into intrigue. Um... If you want Casus Belli cost to come down, then you can take Bellum Justum, right? There's all these little easy, easy tricks that you can do with lifestyle focus. But the next thing that we're going to look at is 
the next the next emperor emperor benito so emperor benito 1210 all right and this one is going to be about factions okay and this this period in my run i had so many factions I had civil wars, I had factions, I had um, about 30 years in a row where it was just civil war all the time. And um, I think like a, a king, an old king died, if I remember correctly. His son um, had really low intrigue, got murdered. His daughter was a baby. And I managed to to not lose the Civil War, but then the moment that she, um, the first Civil War, then the moment that she got old, she she grew up. There was a second Civil War, and then she got murdered, and there was a whole whole long time of factions, maybe thirty years of factions Civil War, and in this time, I learned a lot about how to put down factions, how to avoid trouble with your factions. And we're going to take a look at how to uh, not, not totally lose if you have a bunch of factions brewing. Okay, now the first, the first and easiest thing that you can always do is dread. Okay, now right now we have zero, zero dread. And it says here, well, let's get rid of that title. It's not helping anything. Okay, so it says here, dread. If you look down there, um, it says dread makes it viable to play as a tyrant because unruly vassals be can become intimidated or terrified, making them too scared to oppose you. Okay, now this is also true or children, or weak vassals, weak kings, or kings that have bad traits, right? And this is my case because um, it says it's a sinful. I'm sinful to my my religion. Okay, and the sins that you end up with. First of all, don't take sins. Never ever take sins when you're growing up. You have a choice to avoid sins. Do not take them. This will make it harder. Always look at the religion to see what the sins are. But we can talk about that in the next part. Right. Um, but back to the dread thing. Right. Down here at the bottom of the dread thing, look at all the things that dread gives you. Vassals are discouraged from joining factions. Vassals are discouraged from scheming. It increases vassal acceptance of title revocation. And interestingly, it increases vassal acceptance of imprisonment. Um, it increases vassalization offer. So if you want to vassalize someone outside of your realm and you have high dread, they'll take it. It makes electors more likely to vote as you if you have uh, an election type of succession law and makes vassals unlikely to oppose law changes if you're trying to change a law in your realm. Okay, now how do you get more dread? Well, a very, very easy way is if you go over here, and look at prisoners, okay, and you want to find a prisoner that's not the same religion as you because killing prisoners of the same religion causes other problems, right? So um, an orthodox one would work, but... Okay, so you see this guy, he's orthodox, all right. We can kill him, and we gain piety, but more importantly, we gain dread. We gain 11 dread, so he's burned. We go back here, now we have 11 dread. All right, cool. And because of that dread, right. This is all lower. 
It's all lowered. All right. And so if you have a faction forming and you don't know how to get out of it, go to your jail and and execute a bunch of people. Push up your dread. And and that will help you avoid the faction. Um, the other thing that you can do is this guy's getting old. This guy is 69, right? He's going to die soon. So one of the worst times for factions is when you have a succession, right? And this guy's son here is who, in my run, he ended up getting murdered because, yeah, his intrigue is average. It's not great. And within a couple months of taking the throne, he was murdered, right? And looking back, what I should have done is I should have come here, looked at all these vassals, like, look, he's 100%. So we just imprison him. Bam, justice. Okay, who else is at 100%? 55. And remember, something that we'll get to in a second is that I'm not Catholic, okay? So I can actually execute Catholics. But the religion portion is next. All right. So I can execute all these Catholics. And push up my dread. Eighty. Okay, it's at a hundred. So now we go back to these vassals, a hundred. Eighty-seven, fifty-five, a hundred, thirty-five. Thirty-five, a hundred, ooh, a king. This is really good. A hundred. Okay, now in my run, I did not do this. I, I was not paying attention, and this did not actually happen. If it had, then I might have been able to avoid like 30 years of civil war. Which is what followed this guy's death. And he's old, right? 70 years old. He's going to die any minute. And he died... His son got murdered, but look, look at this. I was, I was so ready. This, this partnership, this pairing would have been very nice. Genius and quick. He has nice traits. This is virtuous, right? But because I failed to, to deal with my vassals before I died, it all came undone, and I spent 30 years dealing with civil war. Okay, so now if we look. Look at all these vassals that are in jail. Maybe half of my vassals. And most of the, the kings are in jail. And that's definitely what you want on a succession okay um, the, the next piece of advice that i want to give you is is that if you have a civil war right if you're fighting a civil war you don't need to win it this is a little trick okay winning a civil war is not necessary 
all you need to do is white peace the Civil War. And here's why. If you white peace the Civil War, you have a rightful imprisonment over all of the participants. So as soon as you white peace, then you go up here and you look for all the participants of the Civil War and you just imprison them. If you can't, then you go push up your dread, try again, and you should be able to imprison at least half of them, which will prevent them from doing Civil War again. Now, you might be tempted to take revenge and murder anyone that participated in the Civil War, but I'm going to tell you now, don't do that. Leave them in jail. If people, if you're... you're uh, subjects, if your vassals are in jail, they can't scheme against you. Right? And so that is what you want. Look, my most powerful vassal is in jail. My second most is in jail. My fifth most is in jail. It's, it's impossible for someone to, to do a successful scheme against me. They can't. And so as soon as I die, I'm pretty much safe, I think. If I had done this the first time around, it would have ended up much, much better for me. I wouldn't have had to waste basically 30 years on Civil War. Ah, well. Okay, so the next thing... Is religion. Okay, cool. So we can go to Benito. A little bit earlier. To show you exactly what happened. So you might have noticed if you were paying attention that I have a custom religion here. Yeah? And this custom religion is a, a reformed um, Catholicism. Uh, you see, I have several dangerous factions. We'll take a look at those in a second. But look, I have a reformed religion. It's called fucking God, right? Right? And you can see is the fucked branch of Catholicism. And my tenants over here are armed pilgrimages because I still want to do holy wars and crusades. Divine marriage, um, I can marry my sister, and everyone in the faith will give me plus 10 opinion. In legalism, I get extra bonuses for virtues and extra uh, penalties for sins. And um, that is why, for, for one, one problem I'm having at the moment, let's see, he has a sin. He's vengeful. Is a problem, right? Um, but my other benefits here, and something that I'm going to spend the rest of the game, rest of the run, trying to accomplish, is you see, I have lay clergy, and down here, temporal revocable um, clerical appointment, and that means that I can appoint myself as Pope. But to do it, I need another holy site. And I eventually end up taking the, the site of Canterbury to do it. And as soon as you do that, then you can declare your own crusades. Right. Now, the other thing I took was fundamentalist. And look, this one is a little bit dangerous because it means that both Catholics and Orthodox consider you evil and they will do holy wars and crusades against you. But you can do holy wars and crusades against them. It's a double-edged sword. And to, to avoid that, you don't want to... Look, you, don't, you want to make sure that this fervor count, especially on Catholicism because they're near you, never gets too high. So one mistake I make at one point in the game is I holy war for all of France. 
And when you win a holy war, you lose fervor. When you lose a holy war, you gain fervor. And Catholicism gained a lot of fervor for me, totally kicking ass in France. And this led to a few problems. Let's see if we have one here. I'll show you an example. Yeah. So you can see here that there's a uh, religious faction. And this one, they're, they're probably never going to be powerful enough to send an ultimatum, which is good, because I don't want to deal with them. But when I holy war for all of France, this is a, lo this is a big chunk of territory, and I ended up being completely overwhelmed, having to restart to go back and, and save scum a little bit, uh, because I was dealing with revolts all over France, and a crusade. And when I, when I got weakened by that, two separate pretenders for the throne um, were attacking me. And there was really nothing I could do. I lost um, everything. So the major lesson here is if you're going to holy war, if you're going to crusade, don't be, be careful. Be careful. Got to watch out for the fervor. The fervor of whoever it is that you're attacking. If you're if you're big enough, you know, if you're Catholic and you're holy warring for for Africa or or Jerusalem even, then you're probably safe. But if you are like me and you want to create your own religion, then you need to be careful. Okay. Now, on the topic of creating your own religion, there are some lifestyles that would help you out. And I missed this. This was a mistake that I made, something that I learned. I missed this. If you're going to create your own religion, you want to take a scholar. Hey, Mr. White Fire Master, what's up? How's it going? Cool. Mgo. <laughs> I'm just explaining about uh, creating your own religion. Check it out. I I have my own custom religion here. Um, and I'm explaining that I I actually made a mistake when I did that. I'm good, having a good Saturday, relaxed. And so when I created my my fucked religion. I, I messed up because I took whole of body for my health, which allowed him to live to be like 75, and that's nice. But this trait, apostate, if you want to reform, create your own religion, you absolutely need apostate. Because look at these traits. Faith conversion cost, 75%. Um, you you need this to make the the faith be cheaper, okay? And, or you can go over to theologian. You can take some of these, and these are also really useful for creating your own faith. Um, but the whole of body that I did was was not useful at all. Open-minded is also nice because it, it kind of prevents those factions from forming when you create your own religion. Um, yeah, I just made things really difficult on myself by taking whole of body. Uh, diplomacy, there are some good ones here that are also nice if you want to create your own faith. But the way that I did it was definitely the wrong way. Um, so... That's that's a lot of religion, um, and the last little tip I'm going to give you 
is so I created this religion. The idea was for me to declare myself the anti pope, declare myself my own pope. But to do it, you need two holy sites. Oops. You need two of these holy sites. Right. Vincest. That's nice. Cool, man. Uh, I actually didn't like these tenets, but I couldn't think of better tenets to get, you know? Like, I like armed pilgrimages, that's fine, but divine marriage and legalism, I was not convinced about. Do you have suggestions for other tenets? Because, honestly, I, I'm not impressed by the tenets here. I, I could not find two other ones that I really liked. I guess, yeah, carnal exaltation maybe, but I don't want so much fertility. Having 25% extra fertility would have too many children, too many heirs. Maybe consolamentum? I don't know. This is what I ended up with when I created it, but I was not I was not impressed with the tenets. That's what I gotta say. If you have any suggestions for tenets, you let me know. Yeah. Alright, so the next tip, the next thing, the number five tip. is how to keep your vassals happy and that is we're going to go all the way forward to pope vicente of the fucked papacy Jabba. Why Jabba? Okay, here. So you see, uh, my my empire has grown. It's bigger, um, because Jabba, Jabba the Hut. I don't get it. You get back to me. <laughs> okay, so the first one, the first tip for how to keep your vassals happy is this. I have divine marriage and legalism, right? So it's simple, it's easy. I'm married to my sister, and I have chaste. So that gives me a nice boost. All right, but that's sort of specific. That's for me. Now, uh, the next thing that we can look at is it's only for a little bit of fun. Still don't get it. I guess I'm I'm dumb. I don't get it. So the next thing that you want to look at is your your empire du jour area. Okay? Now, what I have done if we look at all the titles, okay? I have only handed out kingdoms inside of my empire du jour area and why why is this well outside of my empire's du jour i am not the rightful liege i am not the rightful ruler and so if i handed out a kingdom over here like to the duchy of fez or any of these other ones i think you can even see it here it says not rightful liege look at this minus five okay I would have uh, a negative influence. I would have a negative. But these guys, uh, somewhere it says rightful liege or du jour liege. Somewhere in there. Right. And so if you're du jour, you get a bonus. Right. Now, something that they're complaining about 
It's something that I can fix, I can show you, but you probably know. Is I have too many duchies, right? Like this duchy that I just won in a crusade, I need to give away. Okay, I just won this crusade. Oh, these guys are running away. And I have this this extra county that I don't really want. So let's go find somebody here to give it to. I don't have any extra children. Unfortunately. But maybe that nephew guy. Go back. He's a baby. Right, right, right. Forget it. This is what we'll do. You... Maybe. This is what we'll do. Isn't there a woman with my blood around here somewhere? My sister and sister-in-law. Okay. So, here. We're going to look at some marriage things. Alright. So, what I'm looking for here is a vassal to take over this county and this duchy. Alright. Now, I am married to my sister, and I'm getting an opinion boost because of it. Because my religion is fucked. The fucked religion gives you a bonus for for being married to your sister. Jamie, seriously, man, it's blessed by the Pope. Who is me? I'm the Pope, and I say that marrying your sister is is very good. Yeah. All right. So when you're looking for somebody to marry, all right. I say always toggle filters. Toggling filters is super important. And you can go over here and filter a ton of stuff, right? Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to filter for traits. We're going to look for inheritable traits. And because this is my, this is my sister and sister-in-law at the same moment, because I'm married to, I am married to my sister, so my sister is my sister-in-law, if you can follow that logic. Okay, so this, uh, she's already of my blood, so we're going to keep the blood by staking matrilineal. She's genius, she's hail, so we filtered for traits. We could take somebody that's fecund, and they could have a ton of children one option or robust or handsome any beautifuls here there we go beautiful i think we're going to take you you're forgiving and deceitful it's an interesting combination but you have beautiful okay so they get married Matrilineal. Oh, I could die soon. Uh, I... Whatever. Ah, uh, now I'm a cannibal. Eh, interesting. Okay, but that's not what this moment is about. Right, 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 great. Okay, so then this guy, he is now married to my sister. Make sure he, he switches to my religion. Give him Kariwon and the duchy. Then, I'm 
I'm sick, but that's not important. Okay. Now that I've got rid of that duchy, we go back to one of my, my guys here, and I'm no longer over the duchy limit. People love me. Okay. You have to watch the number of duchies that you have, which is two, I think. I think the maximum number of duchies you can have is two. Which I have. And the maximum number of kingdoms you can have is two. Which I have. And the only reason I have the Kingdom of Africa is that I just won it in uh in a crusade. And I would very much like to get rid of it, maybe even to this wonderful guy that I just made a vassal. But, like I was saying at the beginning, it's not part of my du jour. So, no kingdom. This will be part of my du jour in 27 years. Then I can create kingdoms in my territory. This will be my du jour in 41 years, and I can create more kingdoms. So that's, that's how you keep your vassals happy, is to... Really, in my opinion, I only create kingdoms inside of my du jour territory. Outside, they get an opinion penalty, and then you're 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 going to be in trouble. Um, the other thing that you probably saw with this guy, the king of Andalusia, this is opinion. He wants a seat on the council. All right. So if you look at your vassals, right, your powerful vassals will always want a seat on the council, and that's fine. Uh, you can give it to them if you want. Sometimes you have to, other times not, right? But like I said before, what you can do is dread. Dread will always solve this problem. So all you got to do is execute people. Why is Giovanni? Who the Bane? And if you execute enough people, now we're at 100, right? Now we go back. And look, this guy's terrified. He's terrified of me. He's not going to do anything. Even if he, he wants to see it on the council, whatever, man. You're terrified. You're not going to oppose me. Okay? Um, the, the other thing, if you're like really, really, really stuck, if you're, if you, if you can't avoid the situation, I'm not there now. See, I just have a bunch of dread. I'm big. There's, there's really nothing that I'm worried about. Um, what you can do. Eh? Gosto? É um jogo é, muito complexo, né? What you can do about these, like, if, if this, let's imagine for a moment, uh, this vassal was leading a faction uh, trying to overthrow you. And you tried everything. You tried upping your dread. You tried uh, bribing. You tried imprisoning, right? You can imprison people. Now, he is uh, Brazilian. Um, he, like, like I, I live in, in Sao Paulo, Mr. Whitefish. I live in Sao Paulo in Brazil. I'm American, but I live here. And Giovanni is also Brazilian. Portuguese. Uh, anyway, so what you can do, if we just imagine that there's nothing, you have no other options. You don't know what you can do to prevent a civil war. Well, if you give somebody 
a title, especially a title that they want, right? He wants the uh, the kingdom of Africa because El Gosto Civilization combined. If you give him the title of Africa, um, you can delay the problem because look at this. You give him the title of Africa, and now um, he has a he has a alliance and a there's too many here a truce with you for ten years if you give someone a kingdom or a duchy. It also works with duchies. They they can't attack you if you give them a kingdom. Now, of course. By giving them a kingdom, you just made them more powerful. It's a, it's a, it's a delay tactic. But if you're in a tight situation and you're going to lose a civil war, unless you delay, maybe you have a, a baby king and you just need five or six years to, to wait, to delay. Giving somebody a kingdom title or a duchy title might be the solution for you. Okay. Um so so those were my tips. Um the the last like secret tip um is is here and is a big mistake that I made and it's your settings, okay? And what happened to me is I've actually meant to play this game with Iron Man on with the Iron Man settings. And I forgot to click the box. So if we uh, we go out to the main menu and we start a new game, okay, um, what happened to me is I clicked on King Sancho and I just forgot this little Iron Man box. I just forgot to click it. And it took like an hour or two or three of, of playing, like a hundred years of stuff happened before I realized what I forgot. So the other game rules, you always want to check them before you start just to make sure they're correct because you might not notice for a couple hours and then either you have to restart or play the game out with the wrong settings. And and for me it was okay. Um I didn't mind. But this next game, whatever the next game I play, um, I think I'm going to play an 867. Somewhere. And if, if you guys have any suggestions of where to play for my next run on Iron Man, then let me know. Um... But that's not what I wanted. Oh, yes, it is. Okay. So I can choose any of these characters. Um, I was thinking maybe somewhere over here in Anatolia, in Greece. Um, I was thinking I, I got the DLC for the Vikings, so maybe a Viking run would be interesting. I don't know. Do you guys have a suggestion? Somewhere interesting, somewhere that you like to play in? In 867, let me know. But always remember that, that like, you choose a character. Come here and check the settings before you push start. Don't mess that up. All right. So, um, those... Those were um, five tips for you before you you start your next um, run of CK3. And if you remember them, they were about renown, succession, um, factions, religion, and vassals. Okay, and maybe tomorrow 